Upstairs at Fralix, show 211, real one. Oops, I did it again. No ticket. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the East Rail 177 Trilogy. I'm your host, John Fralick, and with me as always is... Uh, some guy. I don't know. Some guy? <laughs> M. Night Shyamalan? Are you there? No, I'm David. David Dunn, the uh, hero of the three movies. Well, actually, two. He's only a hero in... He's, well, he's a hero in one movie, and he's not in the second one, and... I don't know what he, he makes that blip appearance in the second. One. Yeah, just at the end, boom, 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 boom. You hear that sexy hip hop music playing in the background. Uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about the three movies that you never would have figured would have been would have formed the part uh, formed all parts of a trilogy because uh, when Unbreakable first came out, M Night was talking about possibly doing a sequel, but then he never got around to it. It took forever to get around to any kind of a follow-up like 16 years roughly well yeah because it took him forever because unbreakable while it did very well at the box office it didn't do the the six cents numbers and on a 75 million dollar budget it made 248 his movies always made a serious amount of money but then there was this horrible backlash against him after um i guess maybe the village is when it started yeah i mean signs he was getting a little bit of backlash just a little but he went full-blown on the visit i remember the visit was so divisive well, they had – well, uh, by the time that Signs and then The Village, of course, came out and all that, y it became like this trademark that he would work a, a twist in at the end, you know? So that's yeah. what he became known as, the twist guy. Even on Robot Chicken, they made fun of him on Robot Chicken. What a twist! What a twist! He would do that. <laughs> but it's like Signs didn't even have that big of a twist. All it was was irony. It wasn't a twist. It was irony. Si Signs, Signs was basically this kind of coincidence thing. Yeah. Where Mel Gibson's dead wife tells him, tell Meryl, swing away. Uh, the kid leaves all this water. You know, my, my daughter does this, too, and it drives me fucking up the wall. She'll leave glasses of water everywhere. Now she's looking at me. And I always think, what, is she trying to tell me something? Is she trying to tell me that aliens are going to land and they're one... Thank you, sweetheart. And that the one weakness they're going to have is our water. So she's keeping all of these waters precariously balanced on edges of things, you know? But it's probably because it's that New York water, though. New York water. I don't know. We get rid of our waters cleaner than a preacher's sheets. Yes. I was going to say, I thought you got your water from the East River. No, God, no. That's where we dump our sewage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and also when you know when the mafia wants to get rid of an enemy, they'll dump a body into the East River. You know how it is. Of course, you could actually walk all the way across to New Jersey on the bodies that are floating. In. And I'm willing to bet you that's not an urban legend. That's a myth, <laughs> or that's actually real life. You never know. Most legends have their basis in fact. Uh, so signs was more about coincidences and how everything can kind of come together. And I guess that was enough for Mel Gibson to decide that he wanted to become a priest again. But I love Signs. I think it's a fantastic movie. It's almost a religious movie, and I almost buy it. And I'm not a religious person. I, I love it. I thought it was wonderful. No, I'm not a religious person either. I think it's a really good movie. I don't think it's a, it's a pile of shit or anything like no, that. No, Even just... Joaquin Phoenix, the person I don't like, I like him in I like movie. him in that movie because that's exactly what the kind of part he should be playing. He should be playing somebody's weird brother-in-law, you know? Yeah, he plays that part to a T. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have no complaints because he's playing to his strengths. And then you move on to The Village uh, and, oh, you know, I mean, The Village had such a great setup. It didn't need that. I think the twist is what destroyed the movie for me it had a great yeah. setup it had a great it couldn't why couldn't it have been just about bryce dallas howard's bravery and have to deal with that rather than this becoming a twilight zone episode where you have this should i can we spoil the movie oh yeah we can spoil it I mean, it's it takes been almost 20 years it doesn't take place in the time that it was supposed to take it's part of this planned community that this weird new age cult leader set up because he has a bunch of well he's actually a psychiatrist basically or psychologist and he, he has this whole group of people and he convinces them all let's let's just walk away from modern society and we'll have this kind of back to nowhere uh back to the past kind of community that's gated around this whole thing you know it it never um i think i think it manages uh the secret never manages to come out because Bryce it, it, Dallas Howard is blind and he sends her out into this uh modern world to take care of uh, um, Joaquin, right? And you'd figure, I don't know why they would shroud her in so much secrecy just to go out into the world to get medicine. You'd figure, look, tell her, tell her what we are. Tell her we're a planned community. 
instead of just leaving her in suspense. Only because the only reason we're not is because she's blind. She can't see anything. I don't understand why William Hurt didn't go or any of the adults who were in on this little secret. The only people who didn't know were the, the kids, basically, Bryce, Dallas, and Younger, you know? They were the ones I who mean, were... the movie made that movie made no sense. Yeah. The movie yeah. was just even though wide. even though I'll say it was beautifully shot, beautifully put together, a very nice you know, very nicely edited. Again, the music great. Uh yeah. The the whole the whole the, the it was the twist at the end that ruined it for me. I, I mean, felt like it was th- kind of like it was it was like basically uh, um, just kind of a cheat. It felt like a cheat. It could have been a good art house movie if there was no twist in it. Yeah, but again, I mean, that it, movie was very successful. It was very successful financially. I mean, it had. I remember it had a great opening weekend because it did like M Night Shyamalan numbers. But the camp come the second weekend, it lost like I think like it had like a sixty or sixty five percent drop. It had a sixty five, but but it still made money though. I mean, it's like yeah, I, I know. Hollywood always measures you by how much because Hollywood always always assumes that a filmmaker is going to make more and more money, and that's simply not true. A filmmaker has a a really good opening, and then it's diminishing returns from then on. Even Spielberg, I mean, like he had his he had surprise hits, but he also had incredible flops for a long time too. Yeah, he did. I yeah. mean, I mean, like, it is what it, it is what it is. So, and then it moves on to Lady in the Water, which is a movie I felt was unfairly maligned. I love that movie. I think it's a wonderful, beautiful movie. It's about, it's about the joy of storytelling. That's 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 how I saw. It. And actually, it's one of Shyamalan's things. He's he's he loves storytelling, and 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 that's how a, a lot of how uh, what he constructs when he's doing. And there's a lot of it in in this trilogy as well. It's 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 kind of the way he constructs the story is like the way you're watching the story unfold. And it makes it all that much better. Uh, unfortunately, Lady in the Water kind of ruined his reputation for a long time because that, that movie tested. I bought a book. Uh, I forgot what it was called, but it was about the making of Lady in the Water. And okay. it talked about how, how Disney turned their back on them. They didn't want to produce this movie. So Warner Brothers picked it up and, and produced it. Everybody loved it. Everybody loved the script. They loved to be in the M. Night Shyamalan business. And it tested through the roof. It was an incredible, it was an incredibly popular movie when it tested, and and when it came out, it was completely ignored. It was spit upon. It was pissed all over. You know, that is such a good movie. I mean, even for an M Night Shyamalan movie, it is a it is a really good movie. I'm not going to go as far as to say it was great. It was revolutionary. I just thought it was a really good movie, and I have no idea why people shit on it as much as they did. Yeah, I mean, like if only for Paul Giamatti. Paul Giamatti is exceptional in this movie i mean like he's he's, he's excellent in that movie bryce dallas howard is great the whole supporting cast is awesome i mean even m night Shyamalan himself isn't too bad yeah yeah he plays I mean, the, he's... he plays the writer that will one day change the world but will be killed for it you know <laughs> it's uh i bought my i bought my daughter the book there was this uh book that m night wrote it was a children's book about lady in the water and i i bought it for my daughter back when she was a very little baby i still have it that's cute. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and then after Lady in the Water is kind of well, he has his wilderness years. Obviously, he has the happening, which I, I still went and saw in the theater, even though it was just kind of silly. I mean, ah, damn. You the know? next, then you you say the next two movies we the less we talk about them the better. It's the happening and the last Airbender. The happening and the last Airbender, and then he um and then he wrote he wrote the story for uh, Devil about a I guess a a possessed elevator. Yeah, no, it was about. Well, you know what it was about. It was about how just it was called the Devil's Meeting. About how seven people were in an elevator, and one by one, the devil clips them off. See, now this this is around the time when I stopped watching his movies. So I don't really. I did not see Last Airbender because I was not a fan of the show. Um, I had I had to see that movie because my kid loved it, and believe me, dude, if I could have gotten my money back, I would have. <laughs> and I did not see After Earth. In fact, I barely know what the fuck this movie's about. Yeah, I don't. I have no interest. I don't care. Oh, it's a Will Smith and his kid, right? Yeah, that's Will Smith it. and his kid. That's all. I know it's written by the guy who did freaking uh, what's that movie with Denzel Washington? Uh, the Book of Eli. Gary Whitta. Gary wrote Whitta, that. Yeah. Gary Whitta wrote. Oh, that based movie. on an book. original story idea by Will Smith. But then M Night out of nowhere came back with the visit. Now the visit was uh, comparatively low budget, right? And and right. Because so he, he decided. That- so he was able to like, kind of throw away. He didn't have big names anymore in this movie 
so so it had a lower budget. He was able to actually work within those guys. Five, yeah, five million dollars, and he and he got a deal with well, kind of like a Jason Bl- Jason Blum. He got that yeah, deal he got kind of a deal uh, like a well, it wasn't like a deal because Blumhouse doesn't work that way. Blumhouse is like if you can bring us something that'll cost less than say this amount of money, we'll make it for you. And everything they do is on the cheap. And I think M Night Healing because we talk they do about a lot of price. stuff on the cheap. I mean, they, they they're making movies constantly. And then M. Knight mortgaged his house just so he could get this movie made. Yeah. You know, he took he took this big risk, but the risk was worth the reward. The Visit was actually a very good movie. And even though it was, I think it was PG-13, wasn't it? I think it was PG-13. Yeah. And it was actually a really good, solid horror movie. And the twist was really good. I didn't see that twist coming. Well, I think, you know, you know what it is? I think now we're getting into this more elaborate storytelling stuff and this like apocalyptic stuff. And and M. Night was doing these kind of like low key horror films that had endings to them. And it was like and they were they were small. They were shorter in length. And you could just like go to a movie like you used to back in the old days where you went to a movie, you watched it. Maybe you felt satisfied and you left. I mean, a lot of times movies aren't doing that, you know? What do we got after the visit? We've got one of the movies we're talking about, Split. Right, Split. This movie, okay. I didn't I never I didn't get to see Split when it came out. Again, ignored, angry, all that. I felt like a like like I I, I felt like a lover that had been cheated on. Uh, so I didn't <laughs> want to come back even though he was doing his whole like turning. I'm sorry, baby. Blow out the candles, baby. I'm sorry. Happy birthday, baby. Um but my wife saw it. Okay, and she saw it on an airplane because she was going to California for her job. So she gets on an airplane. They give her an option for movies. So she watched a couple of movies on the flight. Cause it's a really long fucking flight from New York to California, right? Right. She picked uh, one of them was some fucking horse shit J.K. Rowling thing. What was it? Fantastic Beasts. I think it was like, yeah, Fantastic Beasts or some sh- horror, horse shit like that. Dumbledore, you know, young Dumbledore crap. Yeah, Fantastic Beasts. Right. So she picked that. She watched it. Meh, jerk me off. Fuck you, too. She picked Split just out of curiosity because she's a fan of M. Night, too. So she watched it. She touched. She said, oh, my God, Dave, you got to see this movie. You'll love it. I'm like, what is it? She's like, Split. I'm like, fuck you. Fuck him and fuck you. Walked out <laughs> and the other way. We broke up for three weeks afterward. I stayed in the motel. I came back. I said, I'm sorry, baby. Happy birthday, baby. Blow out the candles. And she's like, it's not my birthday, asshole. And I said, fuck you again, and I left. <laughs> anyway, I'm going off on a spiel here. Anyway, and none of that happened. That was a joke, kids. It's a joke. Come on. we got to have jokes right now, okay? Humor. Of course. In these trite times, all you can have is humor. Humor is going to save us all. So I watched Split. Uh, I watched it a few weeks back, maybe a month ago or a month and a half, because I, cause I, got, I got Glass premiered on, on HBO or something. So I was like, I'm not going to watch Glass until I see Split, because you said watch them anyway in that sequence you were telling me exactly i I, you have to so i just can't you mean you can't watch glass without seeing split i was absolutely blown away by split i mean this this was a fan this was an incredible movie and it was so and what the fuck dude james mcavoy is like a an actor he's like a real actor hell even creepy girl is fantastic in it and i was like oh my god that's creepy girl from the witch movie that i watched the uh the guy the guy who did lighthouse made a movie called um the witch and and anya taylor joy who I will forever call creepy girl from now on because she's kind of creepy looking. Even though she's a very, uh, very, very beautiful girl, but she's her eyes are like really far say, apart. It's the eyes, Chico. <laughs> it's they the never, eye. they never lie. They never lie. And she's got a great ass. <laughs> she's got a great ass. Uh, yeah, beautiful girl uh, has an almost alien look about her, and I think that that's really because you can find a cookie cutter blonde, cookie cutter girls. They all look alike. It's the ones that don't look like them. That, that Those are the ones you remember. And she's a fine actress. Yeah. And then we get to Glass, 2019, the sequel. Also, are, is it, was Glass also a Blumhouse? I don't... Yeah, it was, a, it was a, what is it, co-production between Blumhouse and Disney. Well, Universal Pictures, Buena Vista. Universal Pictures in the United States, Buena Vista internationally, with uh, Jason Blum producing, as a, and Blumhouse was a production company at that point. For this movie, because I maybe he didn't want to he didn't want to spend any money. <laughs> so Split was a nine million dollar production. It made it made almost three hundred million dollars, which is an enormous hit. So uh, M Night was effectively back. But then you told me that after Glass came out, it didn't get very good reviews. So where are we then? It, Even though Glass made money, it's also a hit, a big hit on a low budget too. Because the thing is, dude, Glass, it was just a divisive movie. I mean, you enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it, right? I, I did enjoy it quite a bit. I, I didn't it so think it was more... as good as Split because Split 
is the beginning of a character. Glass is is the culmination and the re- reuniting of different characters. So it was Glass was more truly a sequel. So it was a sequel, whereas Split was a variation. Right. Like Split was kind of like Unbreakable One Point Five. Right. And I. I really did like Split, but I loved Glass so much more. I don't know why. I mean, all these critics wanting to talk shit about Glass. I, I, I swear, I thought it was an amazing movie because when you study film, when you know about movies, when you know this is a Jason Blumhouse or Jason Blum production, you know this movie isn't going to be a big budget movie. There's not going to be a gigantic battle or anything like that. Everything is going to be extremely subdued. I th- you know, and I and I went into the movie knowing that, knowing how subdued it was going to be. Blum, be- Blumhouse has Blumhouse and Platinum Dunes, which is I guess Michael Bay's company. Right. Michael Bay also producing low budget horror films. These two companies, but mainly more Blumhouse, ha- have become kind of a hammer. Um, studio of their time now for this for this modern age and they know that you don't necessarily spend a lot of money and they know how to do it unbreakable was a uh, touchstone film right right that was straight touchstone because Shyamalan had a deal with uh, with touchstone at the time and he lost that deal after they didn't like the script for lady in the water Um, so unbreakable Uh, we could start off with unbreakable first and and it came out in 2000 I saw it in the movie theater I I was trying to I was quizzing my wife about where we saw it because I don't remember the theater where we saw it but I remember going and seeing it okay I was with the movie up until the ending I really enjoyed the movie mainly because I enjoyed the character relationships I liked I liked Sam Jackson and Bruce Willis they always work well together they work well a lot in a lot of movies basically like right they were both in Pulp Fiction together they didn't have any scenes together but uh, and they were both in Die Hard, uh, Die Hard Three, which is one of my favorites from the trilogy. Or no, I'm sorry, it's a fucking. Now there are five movies, right? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. But there's like Live Free and Die Hard and some other shit. I forgot the name of it. Uh, what is a good day to die? A hard. good day to die hard. And they PG thirteen it, which is just fucking bullshit, dude. Well, they PG thirteen the fourth one, but then they went back to rated R for the fifth one. But by the time it was too late, mm. and because you know when Jai, when Jai Courtney's in your movie, you know it's gonna suck. <laughs> so Unbreakable, I, I I was really digging where it was going uh, until it turned into the comic book thing. The comic book thing really turned me off because I thought, oh no, he's just making a comic book movie. He's just kind of creating an origin. I didn't realize how important that was at the beginning because this is original. All of this was original, right? It wasn't anything yeah. that was like Batman. It wasn't Superman. It was just a guy who never took a sick day, right? The whole thing even even begins in a very mysterious way with the birth of this kid in the department store, right? And mm-hmm. every bone in his body is broken. So you, you you like start off with the birth of Samuel L. Jackson's character. Then you then you kind of plunge into the story about Bruce Willis and uncovering this mystery. And then Samuel L. Jackson informs him of who he is of who Bruce Willis is cuz he doesn't know he doesn't really have a clue. He survived this uh this horrible horrible train uh derailment and collision and everybody else died except for him. And in the reality, I mean, you know, in most movies, he would already be kind of like this amazing superhero type, right? Because right. that's how movies are structured. But in this movie, they're like, "We just want to ask you a few questions. Uh were you sitting in some particular place in the train uh are you prone to injury you know that kind of stuff and so you're just sort of and the, and he's like no i mean i was i guess i was just lucky and they're like okay and they let him go about their marriage yeah home. let him go i mean they they don't think anything weird about a guy surviving a train wreck where everybody dies except for him i don't know you know the thing about it is people do survive train like whole groups of people will survive a train because train wrecks train wrecks are very rarely as deadly as an airplane crash like if you could walk away from an airplane crash and people have uh, i remember have. a story about a stewardess who i guess was in one location in an airplane when it crashed and she was perfectly protected and she was okay she walked away from it everyone else died so it's like these weird things you know but you know what? It's still a really good movie. I agree with you most of the way up until the end. The whole movie is really – it is such a good movie. The layers of tension that are built up throughout the whole thing, Plus it just I, keeps you on the edge of your seat it, wondering what's going on. Right. But then by the time you get to the end – and when I say the end, I mean the last 30 seconds. There's, then that's when I start to get pissed. I, I was with the movie uh, up until the moment when Samuel L. Jackson reveals what he truly is. When he – he like shakes he shakes Bruce Willis's hand. He says he introduces himself and all that. And then when 
Bruce Willis touches him. And then he gets the clue in his head. You know, he has like Bruce Willis's power basically is to touch someone and know that they're going to do something bad or something, right? Yeah, he can just read their <clears throat> thoughts and see if they've done anything bad or good. Right. So he picks up that Samuel L. Jackson was the one who derailed the train. And he did it to basically force Bruce Willis out into the spotlight to see if whether or not it was true. I guess he had been keeping it, tabs on him that whole time. But he was also d doing other accidents just to, to try to find Bruce Willis's character because he was so convinced that if there was a person like him out there who was as fragile as glass, yeah. then there was somebody else out there who could be the total and opposite end of the spectrum, could be completely strong, unvulnerable, a.k.a. unbreakable. Yeah. But he did have his own vulnerability, which was water. That was. Uh, I mean, but but then every superhero has their weakness. That was another thing he was saying. Everyone's got a weakness. Everyone has like a weakness. Like Superman, Superman is kryptonite. David Dunn is water because if he's submerged underwater, that's when he's his, his most human. That's when he becomes human. Right. That's when he's vulnerable. And that was true. That was one of the most frightening scenes in the movie. Was when that guy just sort of forces his way into the home of the family. He kills most of them, and he's like just kind of like the psycho. And then Bruce Willis comes in and fights this guy, gets submerged underwater. That was the really terrifying moment. That movie was that that scene was creepy. I mean, the whole movie as a whole. I mean, I love it when it came out. It got good reviews. I remember that. But I remember a lot of people were trying to compare it to The Sixth Sense, and they didn't know what to think about it. I mean, I give that, Shyamalan yeah, credit. That was interesting, for, wasn't it? Sixth Sense came out. It was this enormous hit. It got all these Oscar nominations. Uh, Bruce Willis has had uh, his, um, you know, like we talked about with John Travolta and people like that, his his career has dropped off and then he's had a resurgence, dropped off, had a resurgence. This was like the third resurgence in Bruce Willis's career, this movie. He, when Unbreakable comes out, it's not The Sixth Sense. It's something completely different, you know, and he's just working with Bruce Willis because he likes to work with Bruce Willis, you know. And Bruce Willis always had a reputation for being very easy to work with with a lot of directors. A lot of directors love him. Some directors don't like him, you know, people like that. <coughs> Kevin Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Smith didn't like working with him. You know, I think Bruce Willis is just a man of moods, and I think if he's in a good mood and he really wants to work with you and he's inspired by, you know, your your enthusiasm and M Night strikes me as very kind of like childlike with childlike enthusiasm. He likes that. He likes working with him. He liked working with uh, a couple other directors. Oh, Tarantino. He liked working with. He liked people who were really excited about what they were doing. Um, it was I, you know the Kevin Smith project. I mean that was that was kind of brought outside. Kevin Smith was asked to direct. Kevin Smith wasn't didn't have anything hot going on, so he said fuck it, I'll direct it. And he was kind of miserable throughout the whole movie too. So. I think Bruce everyone Willis was outside their comfort zones on Cop Out. Everybody was. Yeah, yeah. There's also a fact I mean, I'll, that I'll never watch anything that... with fucking Tracy Morgan in it. I'm sorry, I don't find it funny. No, I don't. I don't think he's funny either. <laughs> I, I really. Don't. I can't believe that dude has a show on TBS, and it's the only show so far. It's the only show that hasn't been canceled of all those new comedies they started producing. Yeah, uh, probably because they paid way too much for them, and now they got to get their investment back. I guess. <laughs> but maybe. anyway. Unbreakable was just like an amazing movie that got, un you know, unfair, unfair malignment, malignment, whatever the word I'm looking for right now. I can't think of it. Maline. Well, it was unfairly maligned. Unfairly maligned. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Fairly yeah. maligned. You know, I, and I'm sitting here going, what is wrong with you people? This is an amazing movie. You're just not seeing. I wasn't the used to picture. it. You know what? You're it, not seeing the big picture. <clears throat> it must have been like, you know how I know. I know we both disagree. We both agree on this particular fact that Last Jedi really defied our expectations for a Star Wars sequel, right? Right. It's possible that people were feeling that way about Unbreakable compared to The Sixth Sense. It's possible. But I will, I will be the first to acknowledge that Unbreakable was masterful storytelling, beautifully made, beautifully shot, beautifully edited. Last Jedi was none of those things. <laughs> Agreed completely. But I can see but, why you know, people's expectations would be, you know... But then along comes Split, which that movie, wow, is all I got to say. I, I knew, I, okay, can I say I knew at the end that it, that there was going to be a link to Unbreakable because they started playing the theme music. All throughout the movie, they were playing, uh, it was just uh, uh, basically, uh, I forget who's the guy who did the... Hans Zimmer? Well, no, the um, uh, I think it was Wes Dillon Thorson is the guy who did the music for Split. They were doing his score throughout the whole movie. Then at the end, in the diner, you started to hear this. The, I said, wait a minute. This this music sounds familiar. This sounds exactly like when Bruce Willis was in the train station and people were brushing past him and he was getting a little bit of their life in his head. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Is this going to be Bruce Willis? And then you see him and there he is. 
So they used a little bit of James Newton, James Newton Howard's music at the end of Split. Just sort of connecting. Hey, so you at least you got that from a music cue. I think that's awesome that you knew that. I was kind of like, I mean, I loved the movie in general, but then when that scene came up, I was like, holy shit! Yeah, <laughs> like, like the the freaking. My wife was telling me, me just. My wife was nudging me in the shoulder. She was like, "Pay attention! Pay attention! This is it! Pay attention! You'll see it!" And I'm like, "This is unbreakable, isn't it?" And she looked at me and she was like, "You fucking asshole." <laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't know. I have a, I have a, like a kind of eidetic memory when it comes to certain music cues and certain feeling. Like, okay, I, we were watching Last Action Hero last week because uh, we were watching a bunch of Schwarzenegger movies, you know, because we were going stir crazy. And I thought, let's watch some fun old Schwarzenegger movies. Last Action Hero is not one of the greatest, but it's still a fun movie for me. Anyway, we watched we first we watched Total Recall, then we watched Last Action Hero, then we wrapped it up with Terminator. Right? I, there's a reference that the kid makes to Die Hard. The movie, Die Hard. And Michael Kamen did the music for Last Action Hero. He also did the music for Die Hard. The minute the kid makes a reference to Die Hard in the movie, we hear the theme from Die Hard playing in the soundtrack. Yeah, I remember that part. Yeah, I remember that part. And I'm like, oh, that's Die Hard. I know what they're doing. They're having fun. So I sort of picked up on that. See, I picked up on that years ago because because then, you know, I'm the nerdy kid who knew about composers and directors and knew about Michael Kamen and John McTiernan doing the same exact movie together. Right. Michael Kamen, John McTiernan. Oh, yeah. So I was kind of like, OK, I got that theme. I get what they're doing. Right there. A little diehard jab. I got you. That's awesome. Yeah. Split just comes out of nowhere. And it's like I feel like this is the first time that M. Night is saying, fuck you. I'm telling a story. Pay attention. That's this is like the first. This is a very, it's a very angry movie. Split, it's an incredibly angry movie, you know, and it's a lot angrier than what M Night usually writes. That's what really surprised me about the whole thing was very bold, and it's in it's 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 kind of grisly. It has a, a like a like a really gory, violent aspect to it, you know. And it wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid to you know, pull any punches with that movie, you know. He would. He just went balls out with Split, and I admire him for it. Yeah, and I'll, I really do. Yeah, and he was like telling the story. Like it's it's very similar to Glass in that it's kind of structured around one, one location. And m- but most of the time in Split, you're trying to figure out where the fuck he could possibly be, and then you figure out at the end he was living right near the zoo. He was living under the zoo. And then like the other thing you want to know is like mainly about the beast. Yeah. Like is this is this beast personification actually real? Or is there anybody who could trigger him enough to get the beast to come out? We, we are given warnings. Okay, well, basically, Split starts with the abduction of these three girls uh, by, uh, by uh, James McAvoy. Kevin, Kevin Wendell Crumb. And if you say his name, you can get him to, like, I guess, reset or something. And nobody knows his name until, I guess, in the end, Betty Buckley's character, she's like a psychologist or something, and she, he's... She, right before she's killed by him, basically, as the beast, he squeezes her to death, which must be horrible. She writes his name down. And I guess uh, Anya Taylor-Joy picks it up and, and figures it out. You have to say his name. You know, it's kind of like, uh, what's, a, what's that old uh, nursery story, uh, the kid's story? Rumpelstiltskin. You have to say, Rumpelstiltskin. you say Rumpelstiltskin and he'll disappear or something. I don't know. He's more trouble than he's worth. <laughs> McAvoy's character is made up of 23 different personalities, and he's like... He, He's like a woman. He's a guy. He's like, well, he's Dennis, Patricia, different. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a website out there that has listed every personality he is. Dennis, Patricia, Hedwig, Barry, Orwell, Jade, the Horde, whatever the Horde is. The Horde is, I guess, his 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 bad guy name, his supervillain name. Because he's gonna... Yeah, I mean, it's not his beast name. Like, they call it the beast, but now it's the Horde. So were you asking before whether or not the beast is a real thing? Is he a real beast or is he something that isn't that maybe he's just something that has I mean, it's possible. I've heard of people who can possess superhuman strength, but not all the time. You know, I just thought it was just like like the killer personality inside of him, you know, not like I didn't think anything superhuman or supernatural. I just thought it was like a killer just or some, something, just like some horrible, horrible extension of the id or whatever. It's like this horrible kind of, kind of like I like I know you saw the movie Identity. Like I was thinking somewhere along those I, lines. Yeah, uh, I, I I remember the movie. I did see it, but I can barely remember it. It didn't really stick with me Identity, I guess. Identity stuck with me. I I don't know why. I like Identity a lot. That movie stuck with me. But like I was always thinking about is the one personality in him like his beast personality just this deranged killer or is it, you know, something worse, you know? And that's that's the best part. The movie kept you guessing the whole entire time. 
There's and then when you find out what what he was and what the beast, what the horde was, you're like, holy shit! What the fuck did this movie just turn into? You know, it's really fun. I did not expect this movie to be what it was. I didn't expect it to unfold the way it unfolded. I thought it was just going to be, you know, maybe one or two people, you know, maybe maybe a, one or two personalities or something like that, and just yeah, running I around. Think 20- yeah, 23 different personalities. I did not expect that. Wreaking lots of havoc just based on that. And there, I mean, oh, the before, I, I don't understand why he wasn't nominated even for an Oscar because this is one of the best performances I've ever seen. Uh, even though there's a, there is very little that is real about the story because every story I've read about people who have DID, they can't even function. I mean, like, they are, for the most part, they are not living or embodying these personalities in a physical way. And when they do have these this, these personality disorders, they tend to really become withdrawn, and they don't communicate with people. This is this is what I've read about people who suffer from these disorders. And and for a long time, psychiatry wouldn't even acknowledge this. They would just call it a your 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 simple mental illness, and they didn't really even believe whether or not there were it was personalities or anything like that. Basically, schizophrenia or something. You know, in schizophrenia, you hear voices and. And that's that's what they always considered it. Now they're starting to kind of put it together. I think that's probably why he was inspired to write this character because yeah, because it was like his love letter to mental health, like how <laughs> how, how we how we need you know a structured mental health care system in the country. You know, he's a character that is a monster. He's a character that can be kind. He's a character that can be ultra masculine. He can be ultra feminine. He can even be homosexual. You know, he could he could identify as different things. For some reason, Anya Taylor Joy, because she's the creepy girl, she understands him a lot quicker than her friends, and because of that, she survives. I think. Well, I think it's also because she's an abuse victim. She's a victim of abuse, but do we ever get any indication that Kevin is is also a victim of abuse in some way? I, I, there was some they story ne- they about They never his said past. that. They ne- what you find well, the only thing that you find out about Kevin is that he was in Unbreakable. His father was on the train. That derailed. That's right. That's right. Yeah, There's, his father was on the train. There is that connection, too. There is that connection. And apparently, from what you know, he had, like, may have started having DID when he was, you know, seven or eight years old. But when his father died, that's when his DID just completely went into overdrive. Went into overdrive. I think that they might have said something about his father being, like, a, a, a hard man to know. Uh, maybe, perhaps, perhaps mentally abusive, but not physically. I'm not really sure, but it was. A you know, so it, was, it was. I think it was his mother that was the abusing one because you can see that she was. She kept a very tight leash on him. At least what you saw from those flashback scenes in Glass of who he was. I mean, maybe he did suffer some abuse at the hands of his mother, but we do know that Anya Taylor Joy's character was being abused by her father. Well, uh, no, her uncle. Oh, her uncle. Okay, I'm it sorry. was her uncle. Her her father loved her. Her father, but her uncle was a dirty uncle. You know, he was kind of Uncle Grabby. That's what we like to call yeah. him. Except he was a little bit more than that. He was like Uncle Joe Biden. Yeah. <laughs> old, gr- old, gr- old. Hey, I don't care. He is Grabby Joe. I don't. He's care Grabby that. Joe. He's Grabby I'm Joe. I'm sorry. I mean, like maybe. I mean, like, well, th- there's some allegations that have come out of uh, of recent of him assaulting, assaulting a woman in 1993 or something like that. But the thing, I mean. You have this image of Joe because it's on video of him going up to little girls and smelling their hair and rubbing up against them. And that guy's going to be our president, apparently. Anyway, <laughs> so Anya Taylor-Joy's, um, uh, yeah, she she was abused, uh, molested uh, by her uncle. Her father, uh, I think her father killed himself or something? Or No, no. Was it was it suicide or did he? But then at least we get some good news by the time Glass rolls around that she got out of that situation, got out of her house. And then it's now living with a nice foster family who's taking care of her. They love her and everything like that. That's good. She seems to be okay, but she's still creepy. She's still creepy because Anya Taylor-Joy will never be this actress that plays uh, somebody who you take to the prom. She'll never play, she'll <laughs> never play that character where you, you, you take her glasses off and she's beautiful. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. She'll play. Like, she's sorry, Jane, we got the whole bug eyes thing going on right now. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> Jane, sorry about the bug eyes thing. I'll be in my office. Um, <laughs> that's that's uh, we both agree she's a gorgeous girl, but uh, you know, there's something about she's her. She's not gonna be a, she's not gonna be a leading lady. Let's just leave it at that. She's not Scarlett Johansson. I mean, she's no. a fine actor. She's a great actress, actually. For somebody so young, she's a great actress. 
She's not Scarlett Johansson. She's not. I don't know who's a really who's. She's not Selena Gomez. She's not. She's um, not Jennifer Lawrence. She's not Jennifer Lawrence. Even though she's a much better actress than those people. Anyway, she she like I said, she figures out I mean, like the great thing about it, I is is sort of like this weird relationship that they develop, right? Yeah, they just have this this kinship. Like she just knows she understands him or something like that. She knows that there's like a deeper real character, not one of the personalities. She just knows that his real personality is buried in there someplace. Let's say have some weird, bizarre connection because in glass, she goes and visits him. And in my right, wife, and, and, my wife was like, why the fuck is she going to visit him? Why would she want to be reminded of that? And I, well, I was just I was just speculating. Maybe this was the first time she realized that she could be strong for some reason in dealing with him. It made her a lot stronger. So she she kind of is indebted to him in that way. I guess it's one weird way of looking at it. Because before she was withdrawn, she was sullen, she was uncommunicative, and she was a little weird, even though she had, you know, cute, a couple of cute friends. Yeah, and she didn't even really want to hang out with her friends anyway. She got coerced into it. And also, I mean, like, the way she's looking at him is not the same way that her friends are. Her friends are completely horrified. They're terrified. She's the one who's thinking. She's problem solving during this whole ordeal. They're not. They're just sitting there all panicky and shit, and then she's just there like, guys, let's formulate a plan. Let's figure out how to get out of here. Let's do something. Yeah. Let's just not act like your stereotypical you know, horror movie bimbo. So she eventually gets out of there, but then is attacked by the beast, and then um, she manages to escape, right? She just sort of escapes, figures out where she is. She's in the zoo. You know, She shoots him, I think. But nothing yeah, she shoots. Yeah, she blasts him with like I think it was rock. Wouldn't it rock salt or was it like an like it was a, a shell from a thirty or something like that? It was a dud. They said it was like a really old shell, and that's why. Oh no, they were trying to. Never mind. That goes into glass. Never mind. <laughs> that goes in. The, that goes into glass. Never mind. I'm sorry. Uh, no, but she ends up shooting him with like a freaking like just an actual gun. He takes the hit and he walks away. And then he um he sees that she is like into self mutilation. She cuts herself. And so he he decides not to kill her based on that. I mean, even the beast has a heart, I guess. I guess, yeah. And then we cut to, of course, the diner where people are talking about this uh, horde. And this guy, this woman is, I don't know, talking and says, I remember there was another uh, character who gave himself a name and he was like really evil or something. And then it turns out Bruce Willis is right there and he says, uh, yeah, that was Mr. Glass. And then it ends right there. And that was like one of the biggest... I mean, you saw it coming from the music. To me, that was like a holy shit, what the fuck moment. And then you're sitting there realizing, oh, my God, this is a side story to Unbreakable. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it kind of creates this universe. The movie then right there creates the universe uh, that will become the universe of glass. And again, it's just like it's it's sort of it has a comic book feel to it, but it's not because it's original. It's completely original. These are all characters that M. Night made up. And they're all based in some kind of reality. So it's not like it's not like you can't really look at any of these characters and say they have superpowers. Glass is probably the most realistic because he's he's like the, you remember the scene in Unbreakable. You know the scene that always makes my wife wince in Unbreakable. I wonder if you can guess what it is. It's a very famous scene. It's very Hitchcockian, and it's a scene that makes my wife absolutely it terrifies her. Is it the scene with M Night Shyamalan? getting followed by Bruce Willis with the drug deal? No, 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 no. <laughs> Even though he plays the same character in all three movies. Well, you said Hitchcockian, so I kind of had to go with the Hitchcock trope. It is, it is the scene with Glass on the stairs. Oh, yeah. Where he falls, that's... and in slow motion, we see him impact. And they duplicate the scene to some effect in Glass with the kid in the... Uh, in the uh, in, they were in an amusement park, and he was in one of those rides. Yeah, and then he just he just kept throttling back and forth, and just every bone here and crunch, crunch, and you can crack, hear crunch, 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 and it was like that. And that's that scene in Unbreakable uh, traumatizes my wife to this day, watching it because you can see every bone cracking as he's on his way down the stairs, and it's just ooh. We move on to see. to glass, right? Yeah, we move on to glass. Well, just basically the whole point is they've got. David Dunn is running his own private security system. He hears about the Horde, and he figures out through reconnaissance where the Horde's located or Kevin, where he's at. And then he gets, you know, freaking takes him out. But then all of a sudden, they get captured by an unseen group. They're, all of a sudden, they wake up. They're in a mental hospital. And who else is in there but Elijah himself, Mr. Glass. 
And you found out he was sitting in that loony bin ever since he got caught after David Dunn, uh, what is it, you know, solved the case and got him arrested for all the bombings back in 2000. And then you just find out, and then you find out that there's one doctor who wants to convince everybody that all this is in your head. You're not, you know, you're not superheroes. That really... There's nothing... There's nothing special about There's you. There's nothing special about you. There was I, 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 that threw me for a loop. I thought that Sarah Paulson's character was going to turn out to be a supervillain because I was wondering why the fuck, how did they arrange the capture of Bruce Willis and James McAvoy so handily? You know, she had all this equipment. She had all this stuff. She figured out what, what, um, what James McAvoy's weakness was, which is light. She yeah, figured out how to get him to switch his personalities. And then she figured out, how what Bruce Willis's weakness was water, and you know I mean like she kind of like tortures these people. So I always thought that she was like a bad guy in that vein. I thought that they were they were aiming for a super villain. Oh, there was one question I wanted to ask you when you saw like Spencer Treat Clark reprise his role nineteen years later. Were you like what the fuck happened to Haley Joel Osment? This kid? No, no, because I always thought that Spencer Treat Clark looked like Haley old Haley Joel Osment. But but he doesn't look. I mean, like he, he aged very very well. He did. Compared Unlike to Harry, Harry, I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah, Haley Joel Osment did not age gracefully. No. He's like. No, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm he's fatter than me. So they're all imprisoned by Sarah Paulson in this mental institution in Philadelphia. OK, well, well it's going, like you find it's just, it's just they're all just trying to get convinced that, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. All the stuff you figure, you know, you just figure Elijah is now he's a mute. He's not even moving around. And then you come to find out that. You know, he's been awake the whole time. He knows what's going on. He's trying to get the Horde to help him break out. Right. So they can, so the Horde can fight David Dunn to find out which one the stronger one really is. And then you come to find out the big twist. One of the, I'd probably say that's like the big twist at the end is that, you know, you find out that Kevin Wendell Crumb's father was on the train that Elijah was responsible for blowing up or derailing. And then the Horde just says, you know, fuck you. You're dead. Right. <laughs> I was, you know, this was something that I completely forgot about Samuel L. Jackson's character in Unbreakable. He is extremely patient and he's incredibly observant. So he figures out how he can escape, he even gets the drop on a guard. Yeah, that and that was a brilliant scene. Again, and I'm watching this movie all the time. It's like, why are you critics hating this movie? Like, what is wrong with this movie? What is going on on screen here that you hate so much? Because I don't seem to understand it now. There are a couple of things I could understand. One, the whole conspiracy theory ending. Right. There is this. Where, you, where Sarah Paulson's character and you find out they're part of a secret society. Yeah, the Shamrock been... Shake Society or something. Yeah, the, the, the secret Shamrock Society. Secret Sha She you has know, a tattoo. Con Con Connell Cochran is overseeing the whole thing. You know, they're all headed in Santa Maria, California. Okay, and they're going to take out all the little young kids on Halloween night. <laughs> but, but you find out that basically... Her and a bunch of other people are part of the secret Samrock Society. Right. And they've been stopping people like this since the, apparently the beginning of time. Have, now, what have they been stopping, though? I mean, like... The, she, well, th this for, is basically your X-Men precursor. This is their way of saying, we are aware that out there humans are evolving and we are here to put a stop to it. Gotcha. Okay, That's, okay. See, because I don't know. The way are, you explain it, it makes sense. You're a danger. You're a danger to society. So you know, she, I mean, like, but she spent this whole movie trying to convince these people that they were just fucking crazy. And actually, I think Bruce Willis, for a little bit, does believe he's crazy. He kind of reminds me of the character he played in Twelve Monkeys, where for a while he he thinks that he's off to stop a deadly super virus from infecting the entire Earth population, and then he becomes convinced that he is crazy. And then it's up to Madeline Stowe to to tell him, no, you're not crazy. This is actually you. And she shows him a picture of him at World War One time where he's completely naked, running around in a field that, where Germans are firing and there's mustard gas everywhere. And then finally he, he realizes that, oh, wait, okay, I'm not crazy. So for a little while, David Dunn does think he's crazy. This woman is very convincing. But even then... And that's, that's one of the best tests because it makes you guess the whole time about... Because like the, I will say this, the payoff isn't that great I mean, I like the payoff. It didn't bother me, but it was a little underwhelming. It was kind of like, this I, I is your payoff. My only problem with that payoff, I, I didn't have a problem with the twist, except that it should have been, we should have gotten a little bit of warning in the beginning of the movie, not with regard to Sarah Paulson's character, but that there are people out there that want to 
squash this evolutionary uh, leap, you know, before it starts. If if we had some kind of an indication of that, that's all. Yeah, because they they, they strung that in kind of hastily. I mean, that being said, I still enjoyed the movie. I mean, that that was the one aspect a lot of people had issue with was that whole secret society. A lot of people had issue with that. Well, I just don't. And I'm like, I, I, I don't understand why she spends so much time trying to convince them that they're all crazy and they don't have superpowers. Because they don't. Because at but the then, end, of the day, at the they, end, she they says, she says, them. "Take my hand," to Bruce Willis, meaning she knows that he does indeed have powers, and just basically said, "This was your chance to, you know, go home. This was your chance to not admit what you were, but you can do that. So now it's time to go." It's time to die. And it's it's but I love how they ended it, though. Like, I love the end and and where how they finally they kind of they basically exposed it. They exposed all of this and put it on YouTube and all that. (laughs) Elijah left one giant fuck you to the secret society. Yeah. And that was awesome. That was incredible. I love that ending. I wonder, is there anywhere to go after this now? Is there there's I mean, unless can we do movies? Can we do movies with creepy girls, Spencer and and, uh, Elijah's mom? Basically, they could be your overseers of all the all the special, you know, me, or they call them metahumans that are out there. They could be like the gatekeepers. They could be the ones that teach them how to use their powers for good or something like that. Not to be crazy. I wonder if you had thought of this. Is it possible that David's son and creepy girl might possibly also have powers of their own? Is that possible? They might. I think David's son could have inherited. Um, does he ever get strength. sick? Does he ever? Does he ever had to call in for a sick day or something like that? You know. Right. They never allude to that. I mean, there's. They could go in another direction with the franchise. They could center around David Dunn's son. They could center around Creepy Girl. There's a whole way they could go with that. All right. I think we should wrap this up by by each of us telling what our favorite in the in the in the series was. So you start first. Well. Um, Unbreakable is still the best. I mean, glass is a second, split's a third. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. I'm going to go the opposite. I think Split is the best movie in this series because it was truly the one that totally punched me in the nuts watching it. <laughs> and I'm going to say Unbreakable is second and Glass is third. I would probably. Wow. That. You see, again, Glass still is divisive. I say it's second, you say it's third. You know what? It hit me on a personal level. Uh, Split hit me on a very personal level. I, I felt um, it's 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 unusual. I felt sorry for Kevin. I mean, I really felt sorry for Kevin. You know, even as he was squeezing the life out of Betty Buckley, I felt sorry for him. I still like split because or split glass because of the whole one flew over the cuckoo's nest angle, and that's why I, like, I mean I I like it for a lot of reasons. I mean, each of the movie I will I will say this: each of the three movies has their problems. I mean, they're not perfect movies by any means. It's just that Glass, for some reason, it spoke to me a little more, and I enjoyed it just a hair more than I did Split. If we were doing ties, I'd say, hey, Glass and Split are equal, but I like Glass a little bit more than I do Split. Okay. But I think Unbreakable is the best of the three. I thought I thought they were all great. All great. All great. It, Glass, for me, kind of suffers from being a sequel. That's all, really. I mean, like, it's just the sequel. Sequels are very rarely better than the originals. You know, this other than true. like we we talked about T two, obviously a much better movie than the first Terminator, and Empire Strikes Back, and what did I mention before? Break in two, much better Alexa, movie than Break. Yeah, Break in two, Electric Boogaloo, any day. Absolutely, Karate Kid two, better than Karate Kid one. Uh, you know what's funny? If you want to joke like that, I actually would agree with you on that. <laughs> I was joking though about Karate I, Kid. Oh, anyway, I actually do enjoy Karate Kid two more than I do the first one. Uh, before we signed off, we were gonna since we were talking about you know thriller movies and everything like that, it figured we'd have to at least drop a line to say that Stuart Gordon did pass away last yes, week. Yes, that's right. Uh, I had originally planned to do. Uh, I wanted to do from from the beginning, Reanimator and From Beyond. But unfortunately, those bastards at Red Letter Media already did theirs. And they did it around the time that I was thinking about doing it. I feel like they're in my head sometimes. They're spying on my thoughts. They're stealing my thoughts, man. Uh, but yeah, the great Stuart Gordon, le- head of the Organic Theater in Chicago. Yo, yo. He was a guy who was a true film nut. He was a film nut, and it was... Uh, he 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 it's weird he kind of made slasher gory slasher and body horror movies that were also art movies too he had a great style and a sense of humor god reanimator is like really funny i mean 
once oh, you get Ran past Animator's genius. Uh, once you get past the, the severed head and the biting of Barbara Crampton's ass and things like that, uh, it's it's a it's 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 kind of a funny movie. It's a funny funny movie. Um, and but I think From Beyond I like more because uh, From Beyond is it, it, it's got these great scenes of <laughs> just horrible body horror yes. going on in them. And it's just one. Oh, and you know, Stuart Gordon brought us Jeffrey Combs, the great Jeffrey Combs. who's was, was wonderful and everything. And Barbara Crampton, the gorgeous, beautiful Barbara. Crampton. God, I love her. I love her so much. She's like a, uh, she's like the Michelle Pfeiffer of, uh, of horror gore films. Yeah. She's yeah. The two of them would then, or well, the three of them would reunite later in the '90s for a movie called Castle Freak, which is another movie I really love too. Another great movie, Dagon's another really good movie, and mm-hmm. then also Robot Jocks. He, uh, one of his last movies I got to see, and it was oh, it was so good. It was called Stuck. It was fantastic. Edmund was like the last one I saw with him with Bill Macy. Right, that's right. Yeah, Edmund. And that was a really good movie. His movies always get um, nominated for for fantasy film awards and stuff. I mean, it's like a whole bunch of awards here that they, you know, it's it's um it's a uh, it, it 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 was a sad day that he died. It was a sad day, but he hadn't made movies for years. Yeah, he was he was he wasn't retired per se, but he just stayed out of the limelight. You know, he did his own thing. He was just sort of semi-retired, and they didn't really. And for some reason, he got he because he co-wrote a script for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Yeah, with uh, Brian Yasna. One more thing about Stuart Gordon. I've always loved his visual sensibility. He's he he the guy knows how to control and he he the movies are shot very well. I mean like I'm thinking about like if you had taken like say what's what was one of those really bad movies that we watched that Charles Band directed? Meridian. Oh, uh Midian, Meridian, yeah, Meridian. <laughs> now, if you took Meridian and, and gave it to Stuart Gordon, I think he could have really made a much better movie. Yeah, he would have casted it better. He would have done so much more better shit than what Charles Band did. Yeah, I don't know what Charles Band did. It's like Charles had... Band had a good <laughs> eye for talent, but he was just a shit director. <laughs> yeah, yeah, isn't it? Uh, don't we have him to thank for Demi Moore? <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> and we also people. had to thank him for his son, the one hit wonder. That's right. And also Rennie Harlan, though, who who made apparently in Prison. your in your mind the funniest movie ever made. <laughs> For some reason, I can't. I'm still oh, trying. I'm still on, trying to wrap my head around that one. Stuart Gordon, <laughs> I fucked him. Oh, <laughs> all right. Good night, and everybody stay safe and secure, and do not touch people. You can only yeah, touch always, yourself. Stand six feet away, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. All right. Good night. Good night.